stuff. I find that uh, most of my life runs on serendipity more than precision. Okay. Here we go. Okay, so we're uh, we're doing a reiteration of Rubber Soul, right? Because we lost uh, the file for that, sadly. So uh, we're looking at uh, first song on Rubber Soul is Drive My Car. First of all, can yeah. you just give me a little introduction on why you think this album? We're going to talk about this in detail, but why you think this album is special? Uh, uh, this album, I think, of all all their records, represents the most Dylan influenced of their records. Um, it was, it was, uh, you could see a change in the songwriting, uh, let me see, uh, Norwegian Wood. And by the way, I don't know if you know about uh, the Dylan tale of Norwegian Wood. Uh, Lennon wrote Norwegian Wood and Bob Dylan wrote a song called Fourth Time Around. Have you heard about this? No. Well, it sounds just like Norwegian Wood. <laughs> and uh, there's a story that goes something like his, Dylan's producer, it was funny because he wrote Fourth Time Around after Norwegian Wood was released. And Dylan's producer said, well, that sounds just like Norwegian Wood. And Dylan said, well, I actually, I, I wrote this tune first, so this, the, it, should, it should live, you know. But in fact, Lennon really wrote it first. And, uh, but anyway, Norwegian Wood is a great example of a heavily Dylan-influenced tune. Lennon was very embarrassed when uh, um, Dylan came out with uh, Fourth Time Around because he thought he was mocking Lennon. Oh, and Dylan was like an inscrutable character. He was a mysterious character. He, I don't know if you've seen him in video, but he was very deadpan, and you couldn't, like, figure the guy out. It well, I've seen really the weird. Pennebaker thing from back then. There was footage of him meeting Donovan in London. And, yeah. And really being kind of a, a there's a, an arrogant quality about him. He was very arrogant. He was Bob fucking Dylan, yeah. you know. Oh, pardon my French there. All right, yeah, so... Uh, let me see. Nowhere Man is also an example of a Dylan-influenced tune. Now, remember I said, you know, like Dylan was the guy that kind of opened the door for making a song be about anything. You know, mm -hmm. prior to that, it was all love songs and things like that. Dylan kind of opened the door in pop music itself to go ahead and, and write whatever you want about whatever you want. So now the themes, although there's a lot of love songs on Rubber Soul, the themes of the love, love songs are, are quirky. Like, Drive My Car is is tremendously quirky. I mean, there's a sexual innuendo in that, in the sense that, you know, he's kind of whoring himself for this woman. Right. Um, uh, Norwegian Wood, I mean, obviously, that's kind of a, a strange approach to a love song, you know. Well, um, did you talk before about kind of what was going on in their lives, their, their relationships and things at that time? Uh, I know geez. we've brought up Jane Asher. I know we've brought up Mary Unfaithful. I know we've brought up, you know. Yeah, you could, you know, it's funny. You could kind of get a, a, a running dialogue of what's going on between Paul McCartney and Jane Asher from, from day one of the Beatles on out. So oh. if we look at the McCartney written songs, I'm looking through you. Where did you go? I thought I knew you. What did I know? I mean, he's, he's definitely questioning her now. Um, In my life, sort of a look back. That's John Lennon. That's Lennon. That's John Lennon. And, uh, yeah, that's a beautiful, if you're going to call that a love song, that's a beautiful love song, because here he's comparing all of his, his past memories, cherished memories, and saying, but of all of these memories, you're the most important one to me. It's really, truly lovely. Um, but, you know, it's odd, the McCartney contributions to this record are kind of small. This is really Lennon's record. Uh, you Won't See Me is McCartney, Michelle is McCartney, and that's quite a piece. Um, what goes on, I don't know if that was written, like that was written by someone else, um, that was the, the Ringo throwaway tune. Yeah, the, it, didn't we sort of talk like, it doesn't quite fit in this album in a way? Yeah, but they always did that with Ringo, he was, you know, <laughs> right. he even was on Peppers. He was the wild card. <laughs> yeah, even on Peppers, even on uh, Abbey Road, you know, he had on Abbey Road, Octopus's Garden, you know. <laughs> and there's always like this kind of joke tune, Yellow Submarine on Revolver. You oh, know? right. So yeah, that was a tradition with them, which I thought was a cool one, and Ringo had a great sense of humor about it, he was really cool about <laughs> it. But uh, yeah, actually, uh, all right, Girl is... At the outset, a love song, but um, really, uh, Lennon revealed that it's really about the um, the church. You know, oh. there was a hidden connection with the church. I'm looking through you as a straight-ahead, like I'm questioning you song again. That's McCartney, him and Jane Asher, 
or going through the rough stuff um, in my life. Wait till I come back to your side. Eh, that's kind of a throwaway tune. If I needed someone, there's a beautiful little song that begins to introduce. This is George Harrison. It begins to introduce the jangly 12-string guitar sound, electric 12-string. Oh. And this is where he gets into his kind of droning. This is where we get, you know, we start to see the Indian influence here. You know, we have the sitar on Norwegian wood. Um, and that kind of, you know, jangly guitar sounds he was getting into. Was he playing electric 12? Was that? Yeah. He was, yeah. okay. A cool lick on that one. We'll go through all these one by sure. one. Uh, and, of course, the other McCartney song is Drive My Car, which is just totally cynical, kind of a joke tune, you know. Yeah. Lots of innuendos in that one. They were getting big on innuendo here, uh, you know, kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge jokes Im embedded in the song that they knew about and they figured the public wouldn't. Like, girl, um, she's the kind of girl who feels, feels cool when she says she's looking good. There's a background, it, and they're going, tit, 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 tit. They're actually saying the word tit, and they got a big kind of yuck, yuck out of that okay. that they got away with using the word tit on a song. But it was also relevant to the song, believe it or not, because they're saying, like, the church is like the tit that, oh, you know. the mother. Yeah, the mother, mm -hmm. you know. So, um, anyway, Drive My Car. Uh, this is an interesting little piece of music, because I've always felt that it's got the revolver sound more than the rubber soul sound. It seems like it belongs on revolver to me. This brings up another question. Sometimes there have been differences between the UK released... Uh, yeah, album yeah, and yeah. the American album. Uh, are these, are, as far as you know, Rubber Soul is the same over there as it is here? Uh, I don't know. Were uh, things added? They even had different titles, so I'm not quite sure. Um, oh, another thing we have to look at is the singles, too. We can work it out. Again, that's a McCartney song. We're talking about him with Jane Asher, so obviously they're going through troubles, and he's saying, hey, let's see if we can work it out. Day Tripper. Real, but when I first heard this one, I was like, wow, you know, something's going on here. Yeah. Not just musically. You know, the word trip, you know, tripping. Sure. And there was already, you know, whispers. Well, it was the already the Puff the Magic Dragon yeah. time, all that sort of thing. Right. And uh, he, he said, basically, the song was about, like, pseudo hippies, uh, the uh, kind of jet setters who would, oh. like, trip and take drugs on the weekend and party up, but then it'd be really straight during the week. So day tripper is that reference, like, you know. Okay. Uh, so we'll go through all these. Uh, but those were released before, those two. Uh, yeah, they were, let's see, they were released before, I, let me see. Yeah, well, they were released the same time Rubber Soul was released, oh, the was. same okay. exact day. Okay. So, and that was their contract. They had to release two singles that, that, didn't, that didn't go on an album. I don't know why they had that policy with the oh. record companies, had that policy, but um, they couldn't put it on an album. So, uh, and this is what screwed Sgt. Pepper's when we get to, you know, Sergeant Peppers is going to be one hell of a job. Okay. All right. So anyway, let's let's look at the tune. So we could work it out. This uses a standard trick with the D, where you suspend the D. There's been a million songs that that use that. You know. Sure. And use that. Now already you can hear Bob Dylan here. Yeah. All right. The, the kind of rhythm, rhythmic structure, and again, he's using the Mixolydian resolution C to D, rather than rather than A to D, which would be more formal. You get that more Mixolydian sound. Again, clues of the coming changes in their sound. So this is. Uh, Then we have life is very short and there's no time for fussing and fighting my friend. And now that this is a classic example of the interaction between Paul McCartney and John Lennon. All right. When their earliest days, they really did write entire songs together, so you couldn't separate the influence. Oh, okay. You know, like say something like "I want to hold your hand" or something like this. This, but then as they be developed their own identities over time, they tended to separate. Like a, another example, well, th what I'm trying to say here is that 
one part is Lennon, another part is McCartney. You oh, know? okay. The main body of the song is McCartney in this, trying to see it my way, blah, blah, blah. But you can really hear the Lennon in this, and it kind of hails to the benefit of Mr. Kite type of sound. Um, Life is very short. When we get to the waltz, there's no time. So that's basically it. It goes to the relative minor key, creates a harmonic minor situation. Uh, what, what I mean to say is um, that it goes to the, the um, relative minor chord of the key of D, which is B minor, and it adds the secondary dominant that that relax that brings you to the B minor. This chord resolves to this. Now we have Day Tripper. I, I was. As a kid, when I heard this lick, I thought, oh my god, this is the coolest Yeah, you mentioned, thing. That, you mentioned that before. This was sort of a major uh, awakening for you. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is where I was like, oh, some cool, something is changing. And it was funny, because when the Beatles changed, the world seemed to change at the same time. I think I've said this before. There was a strange synergy between, you know, they were kind of a mirror image of what was happening in the world. So... Uh, Day Tripper, I think, is the first kind of wink, wink, nudge, nudge to the, yeah. the hippie crowd, like, we know what's going on. And probably Lennon was dosing himself with acid by this time, I wouldn't yeah. be surprised. They were certainly all smoking weed. They were all smoking pot. All right, so anyway, um, again, this, is, this song is really all Lennon. And um, it, it, you can tell he has a really quirky way of dealing with uh, chord changes. He really didn't have the clear theoretical sense that McCartney naturally intuited. intuited. You know, uh, but he he was still eminently musical, even though quirky. He just would take these obtuse roots to get places, and this is a great example of that. First of all, there's a lick. and the buildup on it is just brilliant. I don't know if I should go ahead and play it on the MP3 player, but um, they they double up the guitar at one point, so you hear two of them. Nowadays, they use something called a chorusing effect, which is done you double the guitar digitally. But back in those days, if you had two guitars playing the same part, chances of them being microtonally slightly out of tune were pretty good. Right. Right. Or so, rhythm. Right. So what's that? Or, or rhythm. I mean, they, one of them may be a little behind or whatever. Oh yeah, rhythmically. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. So that gives this kind of wobbly effect that's actually rather cool and. Uh, they used to do it in the early days with just the vocals to support the vocals. You, oh. If you listen to early Beatles, some of the really intense high parts, um, they would they would double up, double track the vocal, um, so it would have more strength, you know. Could but both of those, uh, Lennon and McCartney, both sing higher? Was that kind of McCartney's? That was McCartney's deal. Area. If you you want to think in terms of planes, you know, like Mac uh, Lennon was more on, on a horizontal plane in his melodies. They would they they wouldn't jump very high or low. They'd kind of stay on that same kind of path. Or McCartney would take huge leaps in his melodies. A great example of that is uh, uh, I was alone. I took a ride. I didn't know what I would find there. Mm -hmm. uh, that's typical McCartney. Okay. And he does that all the time. Makes massive leaps in his melodies, you know. Well, he also, I think, would be the the high falsetto. Um, yeah, sure, sure. choruses and things like very that. Very rarely will, will Lennon be singing above McCartney oh, in okay. harmony. okay. Anyway, so we have this cool lick. So it's a, it starts out like a standard blues, a, a one dominant seven to a four dominant seven. And of course the lick is playing throughout. right there okay this is a movement of chords that it's just so bizarre and somehow he makes work we're going to hey, hey, hey tripper this is the uh, tritone substitution for five seven this is an f sharp seven on the key of d it's a okay. two dominant seven it does not do its job of resolving to the five seven so, it doesn't do that 
right? So we jump up to the four dominant seven, again, a kind of a bluesy sound, go down a half step with the seventh chord, and this is the five seven of six right here. This is the uh, triton, uh, not the triton, but the uh, secondary dominant resolving to what would be the sixth chord, except he makes that dominant seventh, so we get... Five seven of the two chord, and it should go to right, but he doesn't do that, right? So it's like uh, we get the F sharp seven, A seven, A flat seven. Now D flat seven, instead of resolving, goes down a whole step to B seven, and finally we do get the resolution back to E. It's just, it's just the way, it's just such a circuitous route to get back home. Now, this is without mixing modes? Uh, this is a good question. Um, every time you move a dominant 7 in a way, you're mixing modes. Oh, okay. You know, like F sharp 7, what, if I were to solo on this, when I get to the F sharp 7, I would no longer play an E major scale, I'd play a, a B harmonic minor scale. When I get to the A7 here, I'd play A mixolydian scale. Here I'd play a, a D flat harmonic minor scale. Here I'd play an F sharp harmonic minor scale, and then for the B seven I'd go back to my key of E again. So <laughs> yeah. it really is insane. Yeah. You know? But again, it's got a blues quality, and right. the thing about the blues is you can get away with playing just like E minor pentatonic throughout all the changes because that's the blues. It makes life easy. You know? uh -huh. And if you want a complex, oh, speaking of blues, highly recommended movie, highly, highly recommended movie is Cadillac Records. Have you seen this? Yeah, I saw it way back. Was that awesome? Yeah. Was that an amazing film? I just loved it. Birth of Rock and Roll, like the way it really happened. Well, I like any or those pseudo documentaries that was at Motown, all those soul guys that, mm -hmm. that played behind everything. Yeah. There was that yeah. movie on those guys. And yeah. I think, I don't know, there's, there, I think there's something on the Memphis sound as well. Yeah, so. yeah. But those are real. This was a... Muscle Shoals guys. Sort yeah, of, yeah. Sort of made a movie based on real... So, yeah, I think actually that movie was historically correct. Uh, all the violence portrayed, the, the wild sacks, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, one, one of my favorite moments is, uh, I think it was uh, the Muddy Waters character had just come from, you know, the, the, the cotton fields to the big city of Chicago, and he's sitting on a street corner playing his slide, and this black guy dressed to the hilt, you know, with two women on either side, really classy dude, looks at him and says, you know, you can't play that, 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 uh, cotton picking country music out here. You're in the city now, boy. And uh, so he he recognizes that he's not getting any attention. People are just walking by him. And and so uh, this girlfriend he hooks up with hooks him up with an amplifier. And so he amplifies this slide guitar. And suddenly he's a real busker. He's got the and people start to crowd around him now that he's got the amp. You oh know? man! And it was like the first amplified electric guitar sound. I mean, you know, everything was so historical. Right. One more thing about day um, tripper. Day tripper. So it's like got a good reason. So the lick goes on through. It's an easy way out. Got a good reason. So it does all that, right? So that's the statements of the lick are on the the one chord and the four chord. But but when we go to the release, which is very very exciting the way they do this. Uh, they come from the bridge, day tripper, one way to get flown on. They find out, and I found out. Then they stay on the B chord and do the lick on there, and this is where they build it up. Uh, you know, that whole thing. And it, all that Harrison stuff at the end, it builds up to this lick up top. And then, you know, it's constantly building it, and boom, back down. And it is beautiful. Beautiful. It's just like creating so much tension. The five chord is wanting to go home, wanting to go home, wanting, but they hold, they suspend you there. Finally, they bring it back, and it's just so pleasing because there's that cool lick to come home to.